So goes the chorus of country's most haunting song, one of, if not the most, famous country western song of all time. Stan Jones' warning to all prodigal cowboys, ghost riders in the sky, a cowboy legend, otherwise known simply as ghost riders in the sky, a tale of a damned troop of cowboys forced to chase the devil's herd across the endless sky, a song written by Stan Jones and made famous in performance by both Burl Ives and Vaughn Monroe. After that, the song became a cornerstone of country western music and American popular legend in general. And a bridge list of covers alone since 1948 proves the ballad's popularity. Ghost Riders has been recorded by iconic country artists and beyond. Jones, Ives, and Moreau's originals were released in 1949, Cowboy Superstar Gene Autry in 1949, Bing Crosby in 1949, Sons of the Pioneers, also in 1949, Bonanza star Lorne Green in 1964, Roy Clark in 1973, The Man in Black Johnny Cash in 1979, Marty Robbins in 1984, R.E.M. in 1990, and the song was even featured in the movie Blues Brothers 2000 in... 2000. Also, Charlie Daniels covered the song in 2016, and may have even inspired The Doors' Riders on the Storm, a song with its own massive popularity, in 1971. With roots in folklore and folk music, Ghost Riders in the Sky has crossed all possible musical barriers. There is a reason the Western Writers of America declared it the greatest Western song of all time. Ghost Riders in the Sky reflects something deep in the spirit. While the song appeals to the iconic image of the Wild West in the United States, the mythological origins of the Ghost Riders tale predate the United States itself. It actually predates modern Europe too, and most of settled civilization. Stan Jones had no shortage of ghostly inspirations to draw on while drafting the paranormal ballad. As an ominous warning to the maverick spirit, humanity has long been fascinated by ghostly writers who storm across the sky in war, hunt, or chase. The hunt is on for the history behind those writers who try to catch that devil's herd. While often mistaken for a folk song, Ghost Riders was written by American Western songwriter and actor Stan Jones. Born Stanley Jones on June 5, 1914, in Douglas, Arizona. Jones' early life was not too dissimilar from other early Western artists as he moved about the Southwest through Arizona and California. After earning a master's degree in zoology from the University of California, Jones continued his wanderings by taking a series of odd jobs from minor to rodeo worker to eventually ending up as a park ranger. In his spare time, he wrote songs inspired by his life, the western landscape, and folklore. One of these songs would be Ghost Riders in the Sky, and while legendary today, it would not be Jones' only hit. It was his most personal, though. Jones derived the song from his early life and was inspired by the sights and legends of his native Arizona. There is a reason Jones gave the song the often ignored, or simply dropped, subtitle, A Cowboy Legend. He was inspired to draft the song due to memories of western folklore and his love of ghost stories. The origins of the song's lyrics though, Jones often flip-flopped on. He offered three similar, but not the exact same, inspirations to explain the song. While details varied and intermixed in each time he told the story, Jones often credited these three events as the things that influenced him to write the song. In the first version, Jones said he was riding through the Arizona hills on his birthday, June 5th, when a storm blew in. Watching from a distance, Jones was inspired by the noise and color of the clouds. The chaos, to him, resembled cowboys on horseback chasing a herd. A herd of ghost cattle. The second origin, Jones credited to an old cowboy he knew, oftentimes said to be Cap Watts of Slaughter Ranch in Cochise County, other times an Apache storyteller, and, in some versions, one in the same person. When Jones was 12, he went riding with the old man to check a windmill during a storm. What would transpire is not too dissimilar from the first origin, but as the Western Music Association adds to the tale, when finished, they paused to watch the clouds darken and spread across the sky. As lightning flashed, the cowboy told the boy to watch closely and he would see the devil's herd, their eyes red and hooves flashing, stampede ahead of phantom horsemen. The cowboy warned the youth that if he didn't watch himself, he would someday be up there with them, chasing steers for all eternity. The terrified boy jumped off his horse and took off for the safety of home. 
The third explanation ascribed the tale to an old Apache storyteller Jones knew from Douglas or Cochise County, Arizona. The elderly storyteller either told him a tale of phantom horsemen, or that when people die, their souls go up into the sky, sometimes to become writers. A story from Native American mythology, supposedly which had intermixed with Christian theology in the area. Already an accomplished storyteller among his schoolmates, the young Jones would add the tale to his repertoire, later to set it to music when he was in his 30s. Whatever its exact source, likely some combination of all three versions, Jones would edit the story to his stylings, set it to lyrics, then add music, all drawing on southwestern culture to establish it. Eventually, the song came to the attention of folk singer Burl Ives due to Hollywood osmosis. With cowboys and westerns dominating the imagination of the United States in the 1940s, Ives decided to record the song, though he would not end up being the first to release it. Jones had recorded a largely forgotten earlier version, and the Ives master recording was leaked to singer Von Monroe. Monroe was so impressed he recorded the song immediately, produced the record, and rushed it to market. His version was released before Ives and would peak at number one on the billboard, while Ives' version would only reach number 21. The song exploded in popularity afterwards. What followed was a cavalcade of famous singers cutting covers as ghost writers reached mass crossover popularity. Jones would later say, though, that his favorite version always remained the one done by the Sons of the Pioneers. Ghost Riders in the Sky, a cowboy legend's popularity must have seemed unreal for Jones, who was still a park ranger at the time. Singer Bing Crosby, jazz musician Peggy Lee, comedian Spike Jones, and cowboy superstar Gene Autry would all record and release the song in 1949. While it cemented Jones' entrance and career as a Western music artist in Hollywood, it consigned his original recording to unfortunate obscurity. As the song became a tradition for successive generations of Western and country artists to record, a quick examination of covers on YouTube would prove this. On the website, the Sons of the Pioneers upload has 1.2 million views, Marty Robbins has 4.2 million views, Burl Ives' recording of the song has 5.5 million views. The Highwaymen, the country supergroup, has 7.6 million views, The Rock Country Outlaws at 7.8 million views, and Johnny Cash's version at an astounding 36 million with a second official upload at 2.6 million views. Jones' version does not even crack 100k. This popularity has often obscured the deep roots and heavy folk influence in the song. The tune for Ghost Riders is rather common in folk music after all. Sort of. I'm not really a musician, so don't trust my opinion 100%. It is a slightly sped-up version of the American, British, Irish folk song, When Johnny Comes Marching Home, though the tune is also sometimes used for the Irish folk song, Spansel Hill. The Spike Jones and his City Slickers recording even jokes about the similarity between Ghost Riders and When Johnny Comes Marching Home in good humor. Stan Jones did openly base his melody for the song off when Johnny comes marching home, but this is rather common in folk music and should not be considered him ripping off the tune. Imitation is incredibly common in oral storytelling and public music. It is simply another element that supports the song's deep roots in southwestern slash American culture and folklore. After all, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. While I can find no mention of Jones directly acknowledging it, Texas folklorists and music experts have noted Ghost Riders greatly resembles a piece of local Texan folklore, or part of it at least, a story from the closing days of the great cattle drives that once crossed Texas through Crosby County on the fringe of a notorious mesa, once the edge of Blanco Canyon, but the mesa now abuts a man-made lake as the White River was dammed in 1963 to create the White River Reservoir, but the story still persists in the local imagination and campfire tales. As an old urban legend bordering on historical fiction, many exact details differ between versions of the tale, but that does not detract from its importance. In 1889-1890, a trail boss named Sawyer, in most versions of the story, sets off on a cattle drive with a thousand or so cattle and dozens of cowboys. After a long drive, the group put the herd to rest on a mesa next to Blanco Canyon, a mesa full of grass and fresh water. Unfortunately, upon reaching the mesa, Sawyer's cattle got mixed in with a nester, a sort of western squatter's cattle, already on the mesa. The unnamed nester had just driven his cattle south from Dockton Flats and reached the mesa first to claim it before Sawyer's herd. 
but Nestor, enraged, demands Sawyer divide the two groups of cattle and return his. Tired and exhausted from the day's drive, Sawyer rejects the Nestor, chews him out, and claims he illegally settled. The Nestor retorts, but Sawyer has his trail hands drive him off. Except that night, under the cover of darkness, the Nestor returns to retrieve his cows. Next, as the men are asleep, the Nestor either attempts to rile up the cattle with a red blanket, or trap them with barbed wire. Either way, it spooks the cattle and causes them to stampede off the edge of the mesa into the canyon below, which results in the loss of hundreds of steer and under a dozen cowboys trampled to death. In revenge, Sawyer and the survivors capture the Nestor, tie him to his donkey, then with a revolver, goad slash scare the donkey and the Nestor over the edge into the canyon. A fall which lands the Nestor dead, with the hundreds of fallen cattle below. After returning home, Sawyer was fired, took to drinking, then finally vanished. The legend of the unfortunate herd did not, however. Whenever another herd of cattle rested on the mesa, they always suffered the same fate. Either a storm, or something else, would spook the cattle and cause them to stampede to their death, joining the bones of all the other unfortunate bovines below. Each time, cowboys reported seeing storms with ghostly cattle inside them, some even stating they could hear the voice of the dead Nestor calling out to the cows in the storm, or even him in the lead. A Wild West flying Dutchman forced to wander for eternity in search of a goal or rest he can never reach. The Yippee-I-A, Yippee-I-O, a call meant to calm cattle in a storm, now drives on the herd in the Nestor's hell. From then on, in fiction and in reality, cattle drives and ranchers avoided the area and named it Stampede Mesa, many claiming the area was haunted slash cursed due to the Nestor and Sawyer. While the cattle drives dried up by 1900, the tale and fear of Stampede Mesa did not. Texas folklorist C.F. Eckhart heard one version of the tale from an old Texan cattleman named Lon Schuler, who had heard the tale in 1892 and 1902. Today, Stampede Mesa remains one of the most haunted locations in Texas, according to paranormal experts. Though, due to the nature of such legends, the exact ghastly details are often debated, and even the location is sometimes not entirely clear. While the ghost stories of Stampede Mesa, real or not, are uniquely Texas, Stan Jones, Eckhart, Schuler, and many more were likely unknowingly drawing on influences far older. Their descriptions of ghost riders and ghost herds, even if not connected, are not unique to the United States. While primordial in the human imagination, the nocturnal procession and ghost host slash army myth can be found in Wales, India, Greece, Scotland, Mexico, Hawaii, Germany, and England. For the ancestry of the American Ghost Riders legend though, one must look to the last two. Both countries share related myths of primeval Germanic death omen hunts. Known as the Wild Hunt in Northern Germany, the Furious Host Army in Southern Germany, and the phenomena called Gabriel's Hounds in England. The hunt's exact origins are somewhat obscure, but it did come from pagan Germanic mythology, likely as an explanation for storms. In Christian Europe, events like it are attested in anecdotes as early as the 1100s in England, and the first written descriptions of it come from Germany in the 1500s. In reconstructed, earlier pagan versions of the myth, the hunt slash host was lived by the god of death and war Wotan, Odin in Scandinavia, with his black hounds and mighty stags. Wotan would gather the souls of the worthy dead to join his endless hunt as an eternal reward. The hunters slash hounds, like Odin's Valkyries slash swans, proud the world for dead souls to induct into the hunt. Unlike in later Christian stories, the dead were fortunate to join Wotan's furious host, as it was an afterlife and not a punishment. As Christianity usurped paganism though, the myth was altered to adhere to Christian cosmology. The mighty death god became only the wild hunter who rides a black headless horse, a hunting whip in one hand and a bugle in the other, and is often described as being shy of the cross. A pagan god reduced to a literal shadowy figure of tradition. Even then, in other locations beyond Germany, the identity of the wild hunter was later assigned to a variety of figures, like Hearn the Hunter, King Arthur, and even the angel Gabriel post-conversion. The tale has always been changed to suit the customs, religions, and homelands of the people that carried and adopted it. As a nature myth, it was probably originally used to explain storms, atmospheric events, and even wildlife in the sky, such as the sounds of migratory birds. In the early myths, Odin's warrior woman, the Valkyries, took the forms of swans. 
Later, these swans became geese to accompany the hunters. Eventually, the geese became hounds, a pretty universal symbol of the hunt, though geese do apparently make good guard dogs also, until they, probably, took the form of cattle in America. The tail transplanted across the ocean after more than a thousand years. No version of the tail better illustrates the transformation of it over time than that of the English Gabriel's Hounds, otherwise known by the archaic word gabbleracket. Said to occur usually around Christmas, strange sounds in the sky were explained as the angel Gabriel, often seen as a messenger of death, hunting for the souls of the sinful or unbaptized across England. Here the hunt was not glorious or even dangerous, but essentially a utilitarian theological function, though it too often warned of death, an ill omen retained from pagan origins. The pagan god of death or war, Wotan or Odin, was replaced by the messenger angel of the Christian god in the imagination of the faithful, though in both cases the noise of the hunt was likely only swans or geese passing in the night sky. When fully adapted to a Christian framework, and semi bolarized the idea of the hunt became about punishing the sinful and traitorous. Seen as unfit for Christian heaven, or even hell, unfortunate souls were damned to join the vaguely pagan hunt, a status that kept them from any form of Christian afterlife. Drunkards, oath-breakers, and those who hunted on the Sabbath slash Sunday were at risk of being abducted by the host in death, or maybe even life as well. An ironic punishment for hedonists to join an eternal hunt across stormy medieval skies. Wad in England, a post-conversion corruption of Wotan slash Odin, was said to hunt the trails of England to take those who broke either man or god's laws, challenging any truants to join his hunt. In the roles of Wotan, Wode, and Gabriel as leaders of the hunt are the roots of the ghost riders. The wild hunter became the damned cowboy who calls out, the geese slash hounds became the cattle, and the purpose of the hunt transformed from damnation into direct warning, an obviously Protestant Christian influence. The hunt now only warned the living. In most versions, the hunt too arrived at the head or a within a storm, one of the major sights that influenced Stan Jones in penning the song. What exactly some version of the wild hunt myth did arrive in the United States is still debated, but how it got to America is pretty obvious. While there were some Native American precedents in the stories of ghosts, the wild hunt myth is uniquely old world. The folktale was brought by European immigrants to the advancing American frontier. While it likely did not arrive until the 1800s, it is entirely possible English settlers first brought some version of the English legend to the 13 colonies. Tales of ghostly horsemen were not uncommon in colonial America. Washington Irving's Headless Horseman, or the Headless Hessian of the Hollow, has roots in English, Irish, and Germanic folklore. The word Hessian, itself a term for Germans who served in the British Army during the American Revolution, comes from the German region of Hesse, a distant link to strange origins. It is probably with the arrival of German immigrants to the United States, mostly around the mid-1800s but also earlier, the wild hunt slash furious host was introduced to the United States lexicon. The influx of Germans into the mid and southwest mixed the story with the local environment. Once again, the wild hunt myth underwent a stage of adaption. Protestant sensibility mixed with the chaparral, the hunters became cattlemen, and the hounds were replaced by the mirages of ghost cattle. The leader of the group remained anonymous though, either a reflection of America's democratic spirit, a lack of established figures to draw on, or just because. As Susan Hillary Houston summarized the final transfer of the story into the pantheon of American folklore, but we can see how enduring is a legend that cannot only withstand the changes of centuries, but which can also span time as well as space to reappear across an ocean as a cowboy's lament. The dogs, and geese, have become cattle, the apparition is glimpsed by daylight, but the storm element is present. The form of myth changes, it preserves its vitality, adapted to differing circumstances. Nietzsche and Mircea Iliade's eternal return. Though, the final transformation to the modern story did occur when Stan Jones solidified the song of music. Jones's song commenced the final movement from pagan myth to Christian parable to American ghost story, a process that took nearly 3,000 years and indirectly produced the song Ghost Riders in the Sky, a Cowboy Legend. Jones, through music, was able to draw out something deep in Americans and humanity in general, a western ballad that synthesized his experiences into the mythology of the Wild West that was glamorized in the 40s and 50s. I do not think it is wrong to call the song Jones' greatest work, though I do not want to reduce the artist behind it. 
Jones was more than just a conduit who put the story to sound. He imbued the song with his own personality and told it in only a way he could. It's an old conundrum in folk music. The artist, often unwillingly, must abandon their claim to the song due to popularity. Ghost Riders in the Sky, a cowboy legend, is indeed folk music too. If not by genre, its background and creation draws heavily upon folk ways. The stories of German immigrants, Texan cattlemen, and Apache storytellers built the reservoir for Jones to draw from. This is why the song outlasts Jones, and the story of the Wild Hunt will outlast everyone. Also, the song just sounds good. Haunting, in fact. I should also mention the Gene Autry movie Riders in the Sky, 1949, starring Gene Autry and Champion the Wonder Horse. It is the movie Autry's performance of the song comes from. Still on fire and their hooks were made of steel. Their horns were black and shiny and their It does not have a lot to do with Joan's song, though. The movie was supposedly made in a rush to cash in on the song's explosive popularity at the time. Technically, the movie was not even originally titled Riders in the Sky. It was a retooled version of the movie Beyond the Purple Hills, which would be released a year later in 1950, though it had been in production since about 1948. A testament to the song's influence at the time, an entire Gene Autry movie was recut just to feature it. The comic book character Ghost Rider was also definitely named after the song. Created in the 1960s when country cowboy culture first began to really intermix with biker culture, which later resulted in the outlaw country genre in the 70s and 80s. The whole Ghost Rider, Damned, and Motorcyclist aesthetic is surprisingly popular too. You can find a lot of guys who like the imagery online. The 2007 movie Ghost Rider, featuring the equally immortal Nicolas Cage, even used a version of Ghost Riders in the Sky, performed by the Australian band Spiderbite. Also, the song is in Blues Brothers 2000, but nobody remembers that movie. It did have CGI ghost cattle, though. Cowboyified or not, the Wild Hunt always lingers in the creative imagination, the embodiment of storms, ill omens, and even death itself. Jones' song put a unique American twist on the macabre legend. If, by now, it can even be classified as the same legend. The influence dating back to northern mythology is clearly there, but the meaning and context have been totally transformed, from glorious ethereal huntsmen into herdsmen damned to wrangle for all of eternity across the sky. Supposedly, there once were physical remains to Stampede Mesa that verified the claim of the American legend. If they were ever real though, the last century has hidden them. The cattle bones are lost in the dust, the cowboy graves sunken in the reservoir, and any living writer who could remember now long past. But according to some, the nester's barbed wire fence once stood rusted upon the mesa, though its remains, with time, fell away too. Now all that remains is the legend and the song of the haunted mesa. In the storm, the ghostly cries of the dead still echo, yippee i yippee down through the ages by way of Stan Jones' tune. Now that we've caught that ending, I'd like to give a thanks to my single writer patron, The Single Way Out.